The one thing you'd notice about Edie was that she was different from everybody on the female travel set. Uh, the main thing was that she was about 35 years older than anybody else. Uh, she was really seemed more like a parent who was uh, there as opposed to someone who was on this sort of uh, cutting edge underground film crew. Uh, she was, her hairdo was from the 40s and she was kind of big and heavy and very sweet. So she looks like that she had had a style that was set when she was 20 and hadn't changed for 30 years. So she was really someone from uh, an anomaly for the time. The main thing about Edith is she wasn't judgmental. Uh, she could have all this different group of people around her and would just always have something nice to say or uh, just very neutral, hello, how are you, good to see you, oh, you have a nice shirt, or that, and never kind of any status sense or any kind of pecking order with her. She was very straightforward. As a result, I thought that that made her very interesting. That made her maybe more different than all these people who were trying so hard to be different. And I thought, well, there, was, there must be a really good story there. After the filming for Female Trouble was done, I would go down and visit Edie at her store and just talk to her and, and said, could I make a film about you? And um, I didn't have much money, so I couldn't be a big film. Um, in fact, it cost, oh, I think $1,500, which in 1972 was a fortune. I think I spent every single penny that I had saved uh, on that film. and. And uh, once I started on it, just sort of figured, well, that's all right, I'll go broke on it. And, um, you know, I've, I'll be plenty of uh, time left in my life to recoup all that savings. I never thought I'd actually make any money on the film. I didn't know really what to do with it, except you know, I wanted to make a film. Edith was very friendly, and she was happy to tell her story. She was delighted that somebody would actually show some interest in her. Um, she didn't really see herself as a movie star. She was really just kind of a, an odd character in John's films who uh, made a, you know, an appearance in, uh, as the egg lady in Pink Flamingos. Uh, it was a big part, but it was um, and maybe not the most flattering part for uh, an ingenue actress uh, to be dressed in undergarments and eating eggs all day long. But she went along with the spirit of it and just thought, hey, it was just something new to do, and she was delighted to do it. So every Saturday morning, I would go down to uh, Edith's shop and meet with her. It was pretty quiet down in the Fells Point area where she had her shop, and uh, it wasn't very busy Saturday morning, so I'd have a cup of coffee and maybe a sweet roll and uh, talk to her for an hour, hour and a half, and then by 10 o'clock or so, uh, I'd leave. Eventually it became kind of obvious that one of the best ways to tell her story would be to make a little drama. What happened to her in her life was really much more interesting, uh, I think, is visually than it would have been just to have her recite what was going on. Uh, and maybe her past was probably a little bit more interesting than her present day. Uh, I think a lot of people would have been interested in, well, how would somebody get to be an underground movie star uh, when they were 50 plus years old. Um, and she did have a very interesting background and, and it was kind of funny to try and imagine her uh, as she was then, how she was 20 years earlier when she was a young girl and all the various adventures that she had. So the images that I conjured up in mind, uh, I figured, well, let's share those with other people. I actually caught some flack sometimes by some of the critics who said that I was really being unfair to Edith by showing her uh, as these kind of reenactments and maybe making fun of her. Uh, I didn't see it as making fun of her at the time, and, and now there's so recurrent in the whole documentary, historical documentary, everything is reenactment. So I figured, well, this was actually a very cutting edge film. Uh, in fact, maybe 20 years ahead of cutting edge at the time when it was made. One thing for sure about Edith is she was not a wealthy, successful person at that time in her life. She was very unpretentious. She was actually uh, on the verge of poverty. I'm not sure sometimes how she uh, survived 
uh, with her shop. Uh, it, there wasn't really much in there that was worth buying, and um, she didn't have much money to buy other things to sell, so people would give her things and she'd put it in the shop and, and it'd be sold. She lived by herself in a little row house in Baltimore. It was probably built around 1800 and something, uh, two stories. Was, the Fells Point houses were really old, historic, small houses. In fact, I moved up the street from Edith, just about a block and a half away at one point, and would see her an awful lot. Would go down and check on her even after the filming was done for, for years. Um, uh, I'd see her in the store, and she was always hoping that the film would really become a, a huge success and, and help propel her into stardom, make her really famous. Uh, Edith always wanted to be uh, a success. And not so much of an ego, but I think almost more because she really needed the money. Um, she loved her cats, and if she wanted money for anything, it was really so she could buy cat food for all of the cats that she kept in her house. And I found it a little hard to go visit her in her house sometimes because uh, she never let the cats out of the house. And I think there were probably somewhere 